guys, I have a problem. I need, really need your help. Uh, I want to give a talk on what's wrong with Ruby's object model. And it actually turns out that it's something that's wrong with Ruby as a language. And it actually turns out that it's something that's wrong with Ruby as a culture, which means it's a problem with all of you. Uh, and in order to get this through to you, I have to bring you up to state, up to up to the kind of up to speed on the current state of the art of neuroscience. So just by a real quick show of hands, how many of you understand that left brain versus right brain is crap, bunk? Okay, you guys are the problem. Um, I need to bring you up to speed. Um, all right, here's the deal. For the past 150 years, several hundred years, we've known that if you get kicked by a mule on the left side of your head, you lose your language skills. So in the 1950s, scientists started doing these experiments that cut people's brains in half, and these created a split brain patient. It was a cure for epilepsy. It was, it was actually pretty humane, relatively speaking. And they came up with these, these really awesome theories that, um, that the left brain stores logic and that it stores language, and that the right brain stores emotion and intuition. And um, in, in most people, it turns out that about 10% of people, it's, it's actually flipped just because of uh, genetics. Um, and that was a great theory. It got in pop culture, and people said, hey, I'm, I'm artsy fartsy, I'm right brain, or I'm an engineer, I'm left brain. And science basically said, yep, we proved from these split brain studies that the brain is pretty static. You've got this organ in the front of your brain, it controls, it controls language, and the brain is static, and it's very asymmetrical. We want to know what the different halves do, and this is what they do. Well, over the next 30 years, through about the 1980s, we started debunking these things. We found out that if you have brain cancer right here, and we check, check out this part of your brain, uh, you lose your language skills, but you can regrow them. You can retrain other repurposed other parts of the neural net. So the brain clearly is more plastic than we think it is. And then we also started discovering, in 1980, we invented the functional MRI, which is the thing that lights up you know, when parts of your brain are active. And we found out that every interesting human activity you could ever do, from solving a calculus problem or working a logic puzzle, to painting a portrait, actually lights up both halves of the brain always. So this notion that the brain is, a is asymmetric is a load of hooey. It's bunk. You're right. Except for the fact that everybody in this room, and there's about 200 people here, there's 10 of you that uh, are reversed. But 190 of you, for, for a completely symmetric organ, 190 of you store your language in the left front. <laughs> so I'm not really sure this thing is quite as asymmetric, or quite as symmetric as it is. Now the real problem that happened is that uh, in about the 1980s to the 1990s, there was kind of a political shift in the scientific community. And they basically said, we're going to stop studying asymmetry in the brain. We're going to categorize this as studying beaches with medicine. And anybody that wants to do research into asymmetry has to overcome this bias, and that means that you could lose your funding. And so people stop studying asymmetry in the brain. Now, this is what we call very bad science. Fair? Um, well, along comes Ian McGilchrist, and he says, I don't know, he's, he's Scottish, so he says, screw it, I'm going to study it anyway, I'm interested in it. And he gets into asymmetry. This is the part where I've got to bring you all up to speed now. He starts getting into asymmetry, and what he finds, and I'm just going to say left versus right. You can just remember that about 5% are not uh, conformant here. But what he finds is that the brain is not a symmetric organ at all. The, the auditory processor on the left side of your brain, 35% larger than the one on the right. Visual cortex, 30% larger than the one on the right. The Broca's area, that's the part that controls executive function, that's your actual IQ, 5% larger on the left than on the right. In fact, every subcortex on the left side of your brain is larger than the same subcortex on the right. One half of your brain is bigger than the other. Stand for reason that it's the left, right? No. Right side of your brain, larger, denser, and heavier. Full of protein called myelin, which allows nerves impulses to travel farther and faster. I am trying to hurry, because I got to get to a root talk. But, <laughs> but the bottom line is the right side of your brain is vastly interconnected. The prefrontal cortex is connected to the visual cortex. Everything is wired together. On the left side, really specialized organs, but they're relatively isolated from each other. And actually, if you think about how neural networks work, if you want to specialize a neural network, you have to isolate it. Because if it, when you talk to a neural network, you change the neural network. So they have to be isolated from each other. Or 
they lose their specialization. All right, so Ian then has this fantastic revelation. He basically says, okay, let's stop asking. We know that both sides of the brain are involved for every human activity. Let's stop asking what the halves of the brain do. If they're clearly this different, let's ask how they do what they do. And the man is a freaking genius because what he does, this is 2000, we've got a lot more humane stuff, he finds this great procedure. He says, you know what, we're going to inject sodium amisol, or amitol into one side of your carotid artery and just put one side of your brain to sleep. And then we're going to interview you and we're going to discover some things. And I have to sum him up. You, you, there, there's a great YouTube video uh, that I'll, I'll point you to at the end of this talk. I don't want to show it to you now because I want you paying attention to me instead of crashing the conference Wi-Fi. But um, he talks about what he discovered. And what he discovered is that the left brain is responsible for narrowing of focus, of zeroing in on attention. If you consider a bird trying to peck at a pebble amongst some grains, the left brain is going pebble, 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 seed, eat that. And it's not doing anything else. It's a complete one-track mind. The right side of the brain is responsible for broadening of focus. Okay? The whole time the bird's looking for seeds, right brain is saying, it's lovely day outside, the grass is rippling, wait a minute, there's no wind, that might be a predator. Hey, there's a bird up there waving to me. All this stuff is going on. Right brain is completely enmeshed. This whole neural network is the most epic ADD study case ever. It is completely enmeshed in the world around it. Not, a, not uh, terribly surprisingly, this nature of being completely enmeshed is what makes it so that the right side of the brain is capable of reading emotion in human faces. It gives us empathy. So this whole notion of right brain is emotional, left brain is logical, actually not entirely incorrect. Remember, this whole split started with this notion of if you get kicked in the head, you lose language, right? There was actual evidence to start this. Now, the left side of the brain, I'm way behind my time, hang on. The left side of the brain, let's hurry up. Left side of the brain, isolates context. It likes to do science by isolating facts, single things, narrow it down, get rid of all the context, prove it true or false, set it aside. Next fact, prove it true or false, free of context, set it aside. We're never going to come back and integrate these things. That's right brain's job. Okay? What Ian found, and this is what, where we're going to start tying this into Ruby, what Ian found is that when you have a left brain dominant person, like somebody with a right brain uh, that's disabled, um, you have three real critical problems. If you lose the left brain, you lose your language skills. But if you lose the right brain, you lose half your body. Soldiers coming home from Iraq with uh, bullet holes in the right-hand side of their head will shave the left side of their face, leave the right side unshaven. Not because they're absent-minded, but because they look in the mirror and they see that side of their, their face and they say, that is not a part of me. This should terrify you, okay? person with completely diminished right brain capacity, he asked her, are you paralyzed? And she said, no. He held up her arm and said, Who's this, you know, is this yours? And she says, no. Well, who's, whose is it? It's my mother's. Well, how did you come to be in possession of it? I don't know. It was in bed with me when I woke up this morning. That's left brain. If it's not in that focus of attention, it not only doesn't exist, but left brain denies that it exists. There's another problem with left brain, and that is left brain is very confident. What left brain knows, left brain knows, and it knows it hard. And the third problem with the left side of the brain, left brain's got all the language skills. <laughs> Einstein noticed over 75 years ago that this was happening, that this was this type of thinking, left brain dominant thinking, was taking over Western thought. This is over 75 years ago. He said the intuitive mind is a sacred gift. The rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant but has forgotten the gift. Can you just have my password from here? <laughs> That's because my keyword was in Dvorak. <laughs> you guys know what my host name is, right? <laughs> no. 
I'm waving at my time. I've got to skip ahead. How does this affect computer science? Has this affected computer science? Formalism versus hermeneutics. There's this concept of formalism. Gary talked about structured programming in the 1970s. What this is is formalism. It comes from mathematics. You take a basic axiom, basic principle, and you set and you solve it and prove it out of context. Then you build up from there and add another thing, add another thing. It's called bottom-up programming. You work your way up to the top and eventually you end up with a wrong program. But you can prove that it works right. <laughs> Alan Kay advanced a thing called hermeneutics. This is right brain programming. And with a name like hermeneutics, this is further proof that left brain has the language skills. All right? Hermeneutics is this notion that we should treat programs like complete objects, like biological entities, and we should split them down based on behavior. If you think that object-oriented programming is functions and data, a class is a function and some data, you are part of the problem. That is left brain formalist division, the mechanization of object-oriented programming. True object-oriented programming is about behavior. Okay? All right. I am way freaking behind my talk. All right, so let's talk about um, some code. Somebody did flip my keyboard. All right, so I need you to understand three things about this code. Um, I want you to promise you'll respect me in the morning. Um, the first thing about this code is I wrote this code. Second thing about this code is when I wrote this code, it was my dead level best effort. There's not a single class in this code. There's not even a single method in this code. Um, third thing about this code is that my dead level best at the time, this was written two months ago. <laughs> don't forget tomorrow morning, right? You, you don't even respect me now. But I promised that I was going to bring some nasty code and that we were going to refactor it. So, here is, and I jumped up because Mike startled me, um, so I don't have uh, my slide. This code draws a planner sheet, um, like time management. And this code, I wrote the first version of this in 1996. I wrote it in Quick Basic, and then I ported it to C, and then I ported it to Perl, and then I ported it to Python. But by this time, I was so used to solving it procedurally that I couldn't think of any other way to do it. When I finally ported it to Ruby, I said, screw it, I'm going to make it work no matter what. I couldn't figure out how to do it in Optic Orient. So this was the solution that we ended up with. Well, this is a steaming pile of poo. Um, so let's refactor this thing. The, uh, the first thing we need to do um, is we need to turn this thing into an application. So if we take a look at the application division, all right, well, let's divide up into you know, a bin, let's divide up into a lib, and uh, you know, we, we can set stuff apart like this. Here's the interesting thing. I have just established some ceremony. You want to know what's wrong about Ruby? The real problem with Ruby and Ruby's object model is it let me write code like that pile of crap. Okay? Um, what's great about it is that it shipped perfectly working planner sheets for two months before I came back. I was able to catch my breath and then come back. Okay? So let's make this work right. Let's add a little bit of ceremony. Ruby doesn't require ceremony like some other languages, but we can add it. So I've got a bin folder, I've got a lib directory. I can put draw planner, that'll be the driver file. In the lib file, I can put my planner, I can put my monkey patches. Sorry, Gary. Uh, well, actually, let's talk about monkey patching. Monkey patching is one of the things that's broken about Ruby. Anybody can monkey patch anything, anywhere, at any time. And that's actually what makes Ruby great. So I actually thought that Python couldn't monkey patch the same way that Ruby did. It turns out, totally can. Absolutely is monkey patchable. But the Python community, and this is where you guys are part of the problem, the Python community shuns monkey patching hard. If you use it, if you replace a function, they get very angry at you. And as a result, they don't do it. And as a result, what happens in Python is that uh, Guido basically says, hey, let's freeze the library for two years, and nothing happens. Whereas, meanwhile, over in Ruby, Dave Thomas writes a blog post called, hey, let's do a uh, symbol to proc. And somebody says, that's a brilliant monkey patch. So let's use that. And everybody starts using it. And then the Rails core team says, hey, let's stick it in Rails. And then somebody on the Ruby core team says, this would be a lot faster if we wrote it in C. 
And now it's a language feature in Ruby 2. This is something that is horribly wrong and broken with Ruby, is that it lets stupid people like me write crap like this, and then it ends up being a language feature. <laughs> But before I start dividing this up, what's the first thing you have to do before you refactor? Get some tests. Get some tests around this piece of crap. All right. This, this script is completely untestable. Um, God help me. Look at line four. Um, here's what I know about this script. It generates working PDF files. I know nothing about the internals of PDF files, so you know what I'm going to do? Line four, I'm going to call the program that generates a file. And then I've got some teardown in line seven. And in line 11 is my assertion thing. I'm actually shelling out to the Mac OS. This won't run on Windows or on Linux, because on Linux, the program is called MD5SUM, not MD5. But I'm using the shell to do everything. This isn't really a spec. This is an acceptance test plan, or right? it's acceptance test suite. Right? And it generates this magic MD5 checksum. And if this number is right, that's great. OK. Show of hands, this is a yucky test. Yeah, but it's OK, because it's testing yucky code. <laughs> All right? So actually, hang on a second. Let me tell you something about this yucky code, this yucky test. This test right here failed twice while we were doing refactoring. The first time, because it was a yucky test, we knew the test is broken, so we ignored it. Turns out the font size had changed accidentally because I had moved one of the lines to change the font size. Oops. Came back 10, 10, minute, or 10 uh, commits later and put it back in. And, uh, and then later, uh, Randy Coleman, I mean, thank you so much, Randy, uh, helped sit me and talk me through a lot of the, uh, the refactoring on this. The second time this test failed, it was because we had actually changed the API and it broke, it broke the driver file. The API worked just fine. The, everything from the object model down worked just fine, but the driver file broke. And when the test broke the second time, we said, hey, something's broken. So you know what? This yucky test has actually earned the right to be here. Okay? We will probably refactor this away and make it go away, but not before this talk ends. Okay? This is a right brain discovery. Left brain can prove that this is a yucky test and it's useless and it shouldn't be here. And right brain makes this delightful discovery that actually turns out not to be the case. All right. If I pull all of that script out and just jam it into a planner class, class planner, def self dot draw <laughs> whole script file end end okay then that turns my driver file into this well this actually looks like the, not terribly bad I mean I'm using the trial of gem which I really like a lot of people hate it but this file makes sense this file's done we've still got this huge load of poo that we've moved from the bin directory to the live directory but we have made a clean spot this is very cool the reason we're able to do this is because Ruby, and this is part of what's wrong with Ruby that's so amazing, Ruby is pliable. Ruby is very, very pliable. And what I mean by pliable is that it's flexible and workable at every level of abstraction. In Java, you have a strategy pattern, right? You take two classes, you can swap them out using a couple of methods if they both implement the proper interface, right? In Java, that's hard to scale up, and it's impossible to scale down. But in Ruby? Hey, you want to implement a strategy pattern? A strategy pattern doesn't even rate a design pattern in Ruby, really. You want to do it at the application level? Swap out two modules. You can go all the way down to the line level in Ruby and implement the strategy pattern. Just replace that line of code with what? Lambda. Proc. OK? And then swap out procs. You just implemented the strategy pattern in one line of code. Ruby is extremely pliable. And that is why I'm willing to take this nasty, hairy, stinky script that I'm really embarrassed to show anybody, except for I'm showing it in front of Gosh and everybody, including all the viewers at home. 
Um, I may not have been the smartest tactical career move. By the way, I'm starting a programming startup, so if you need a good programmer, <laughs> I have a partner, and he writes good code. So, all right, let's make this code more readable. The, this, this code is too awful to really do anything with. We need to make this code more readable. And the way we're going to do that is, in the old code, we had magic numbers everywhere. And what we did now is we took and extracted all these freaking constants out. Oh, oh Lord, help me. But you know what? You know what? Now, if we go down into the guts of the file, here's this big honk and draw method, and check this out. Start hour dot dot end hour dot each do hour. That used to read eight dot dot twenty. Okay, I guess eight and twenty must have been important. No, they were just arbitrary. That's the hours I wanted to show start start time end time that I want to show on my planner. Um, this is yeah, great comment. This is so nasty. Um, that's because this 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 equation. Um, it's no more expressive written this way than the other way because this number for y is actually completely arbitrary. I just picked it when I was writing the thing for where I wanted it to be. But we've started to extract the constants. And we're starting to get, like this bounding box up here on line 115, you can see everything that's going on and you know exactly, it's, it's clear that we're dealing with a title instead of just a text box who knows where. And we've got a comment for it somewhere. Now, the other thing is this, Start hour, end hour, each do hour. Oh, I hate that. Let's let's go down. Let's find an even worse one. Um, here's a really good one. Zero dot dot days per week each do I. And then we skip zero. <laughs> Why didn't I just write a one? <laughs> attention to that. The real problem <laughs> is on line 142. This is a basic loop. I mean, I mean, basic programming language. Quick basic 4.5. I wrote so much code in that language. It was so great. Um, but I've got this for x equals 0, you know, for x equals 1, 2, 7, you know, and then I have to turn this, this i, actually for i equals 1 to 7, I have to turn this i into a column width. Doesn't Ruby have some kind of iterator that would let me just do that? Yes. And it took talking to Randy to, to realize that that was the case. Okay, now, there's a new comment that has appeared on this loop, which is gratuitous complexity much. Um, actually, I don't like, is that, that the right one? Uh, oh, right here, 150. It became a one-liner. Um, no, it didn't. Yeah, I'm lost. All right. So it is actually 152. All right. Here is, here is the thing. I have replaced one, line 153. I have replaced this line of code with this gnarly, nasty, heinous looking thing. Oh, heaven help us. What does that do? And the answer is, who cares? We know that it's going to yield our x coordinate and it's going to yield our label. That's, it, 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 okay, that's going to yield an x and a label. That's all we care about. All right, it's a great code. It's not a really good code, um, but it's actually a lot better. And this text box label tells us what we're doing with these labels, or text box, yeah, draw the label at x comma page height, tells you what we're doing with it. So even though that one line is a little more complex, these three lines are much more readable, much more usable, much more workable. All right. Um, one more weird thing that I had to do. If I could navigate, this would be great. Um, I love this. Self.open file. This is a wrapper for file.open. That's all it does. Okay, and there's a comment to explain this, which is that I needed to test. I wanted to isolate this from the file system, so I wanted to intercept a call to file that open and give it a string buffer to write to. And then I could actually look at the string buffer and say, hey, did, did we write a PDF here instead of writing to this? This is good. This is isolation, right? Except that the test suite is opening files left and right to read them, and so I couldn't actually stub file that open. Well, I needed to stub something, 
So all I did is just wrap this method. This is nasty. This is going to go away before the end of the talk. <laughs> Bear with me. All right? I'm pointing this out because this is a nasty, nasty technique. This is bad. You should never do it. But you should learn it. Because if you're ever cornered in the back of a dark alley by some really foul, nasty movie code, do you want to be unarmed or do you want to have a rusty shiv in your back pocket? <laughs> this is a rusty shiv. Philip Glass, really good composer, he has a really good point about technique and style. And what he has to say about that is that you have to learn lots of techniques before you can develop a style. Style is just a, your predisposition to choose a given technique to resolve a given problem. And if you don't know very many techniques, all of your successes are just a series of happy accidents. So, learn the nasty stuff. Thank me later. Let's refactor. Um, I'm burning time again. I have an entire thing here to talk about unexpectedness and delight, and I think that's actually the most important thing. So we're going to jump right to that. So now that's not the thing, but we'll get there. Um, so we refactored out this file at Open, and Randy starts pushing on me, and he basically says. Um, look, I don't really like the way um, this save opens the file, but now if I want to test draw, let's split this open. Um, if I want to test the draw method, um, I have to duplicate. I have to do everything that's in draw. I have to create a new plan, I have to generate the PDF, and then I have to write to a buffer instead of saving the file. And this is duplication. Randy said, let's get rid of it. And the way that he proposed getting rid of it, um, I didn't really like. Um, what he came up with was he has this self.draw that opens the file, calls planner new, start date, and then generates into a file. Well, the good news for this is that we can actually fix our test. Um, our test now no longer has any of this duplication. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I pushed back on Randy. I said, no, I don't want to do this refactoring. It, it's gross. It's yucky. I don't want to do it. And he said, no, bear with me. Do this. Take a look at this generate into file. Line 58. I love this method. This method is well composed. We've actually made a pretty spot somewhere here in the code. Randy didn't know we were going to create this. He just knew he wanted to do that. And I said, no. My left brain knew that line 52 to the 56, the self.draw, knew that it was going to screw up that method. My left brain did not know that this would happen. In fact, my left brain predicted that this could not happen. But I followed it. Have you ever been programming in Ruby and had a momentary experience of the consciousness of experiencing pleasure? Oh, yeah. That's what's wrong with Ruby and why it's a good thing. It forces you to synthesize this right, this right brain leap of faith, this synthesis, and get away from what you know, what you know, what you know. Um, there are shops here in town that do not unit test because their left brains say 10,000 lines of code, 10,000 lines of unit test. If you write one bug per thousand lines of code, every line of unit test code just increases the amount of bugs in your code. I've actually had that said to my face. Okay. Um, how many of you unit test? Okay, lots of hands, lots of hands, right? Okay, how many of you write your tests beforehand? How many of you write, so we're going to split the left brains from the right brains right now. How many of you write your tests beforehand without knowing how you're going to write the code? Good! Good! This gives me hope for Ruby. That's a right brain response. That is a leap of faith. That is, I am willing to accept Synthesis, I'm willing to accept discoveries. I got a whole slide here on fluidity, which is simply saying that Ruby has the ability to take this now fast, foul, and nasty script and move it iteratively one step, one step, one step. You can move this thing all the way up to hermeneutic, hermeneutic OO. We've moved it to kind of object based OO. This is still kind of procedural OO. But we're starting to get to well composed methods. We never had to rip it out and rewrite it, we never had to break it and snap it and snap in something else. So Ruby, in addition to being pliable at these different levels, is fluid, and you can draw it up to the next level. 
Where do we go from here? I hate these constants, so maybe we ought to remove them. But maybe I don't need to. Maybe I don't need to get rid of all this prawn stuff out of this thing because I don't have a feature request that says I ever need to draw this thing with anything other than prawn. Let's just make this a Yagni. Let's just let whoever has to maintain this next, okay, they're going to curse us and say, oh my gosh, there's all this prawn stuff. Do you know what? Ruby's fluid. We don't need it right now. So we're going to Yagni. The refactorings kind of stop here, and it's good because I'm just about out of time. The reason the refactoring samples stop here is that in order to make the next little fluid step, we have to make a big decision. How do we want to proceed? Which finger of the hand do we want to go down, right? Do we want to do recursive OO? Do we want to draw into a page which yields objects that can draw columns, which yields objects that can draw in, you know, labels? Um, we can do that. The next method is extract class. Um, we can do proper OO and separate out behavior. The next step there is also extract class, only we're not going to extract the prawn stuff, we're going to extract the drawing behavior from the plan of class. We can write a DSL, that's actually starting to appear, you can't really see it in here, but I've got some, some, uh, some one-liner methods called like use pick pen, that all it does is send the prawn command to set the line width to 0 0.2. Um, it's very readable, very, you know, use the thick pen. We're headed for towards a DSL. Which way is best? You should know by now what I'm going to say. You need to know them all. So pick one and go that direction. And don't go that direction trying to slice it out of context and prove that it's right or wrong. Go that way to sample it and experience it in context so that you can be completely enmeshed in it and you can make these happy little discoveries. One key thing that Ian McGilchrist discovered studying left brain and right brain is that the experience of serendipity and the experience of calm happiness requires, requires the participation of the right brain. Happiness can only be found in context. So think about that the next time you're grinding through trying to isolate this stuff. I'm out of time. Mike, can I take two more minutes? Why is this important? I've been debating for two weeks about whether or not I want to talk about this last part. Shut up, Angela. <laughs> if you want to take a left brain approach to language, a formalist approach, you can be James Gosling. And you can say, Java is C++ with the guns, knives, and clubs taken out. <laughs> isolate context, isolate context. You can't hurt me. I'm an immutable class. I'm an anonymous class. You can't even find me. <laughs> Somebody asked Max what his design theory for Ruby was, and he said Ruby is love. Period. That's it. Ruby is love. Why do you need to know that this problem with the Ruby object model is about the difference between your left brain and your right brain? I can't speak for you, but I can tell you why it's so important to me. I'm a white, middle-class American male. By pretty much here. <laughs> by pretty much every standard I can be compared by, I am in one of the most privileged cultural classes on the planet. I have nothing I can complain about. All of my problems are first world problems. It also happens to be that I live in Utah, and I'm a heterosexual, and I'm a Mormon. Why does left brain versus right brain matter? Left brain means I can take certain facts about what I believe, and I can isolate them, and I can project them, and there's no room for conversation anymore. Left brain isolates and says, us versus them. Right brain, synthesis, is what lets me say, I am a Rubyist. And that every single person in this room is my tribe. I have friends because I am a Rubyist. I do a podcast every, every week with a Jew, an atheist, and a gay. If we walk into a bar, the bartender goes, come on. <laughs> Right brain synthesis. 
is what lets me be completely enmeshed in the culture of these other human beings. And I can stand here and tell you they are some of the greatest human beings on this planet. And I am grateful to consider them my friends and my brothers. And that is probably the most important thing that I will say to anybody today. That is why this crap is important. Ruby is love. Thank you.